Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to MOOC and PTL course on bioengineering and interface with biology and medicine. In order to bridge the gap between engineers and doctors, uh, we have invited a couple of clinicians in this course to bridge that gap and get the clinician's perspective on the biology for engineers. Today I have with me a very distinguished uh, colleague and scientist Dr. Jayanti Shastri with us. Dr. Shastri is currently a professor and head of microbiology department at TNMC and BYL Nair Hospital in Mumbai. On completion of MD in clinical microbiology, Dr. Shastri pursued her interest in infectious disease diagnosis with a special reference to validating new and rapid diagnostic techniques for dengue, malaria and HIV. Dr. Shastri planned and commissioned a state of the art molecular diagnostic facility at the infectious disease hospital in Mumbai. Her laboratory is recognized by the National AIDS Control Organization as Regional HIV Reference Laboratory for conducting HIV viral loads by real time PCR and early infant diagnosis by DNA PCR. She is the chairperson for Animal Ethics Committee and vice president research society of TN Medical College and Nair Hospital. She has authored several articles in national and international peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Shastri has obtained several awards. She was funded as visiting scientist at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York in 2009 under AIDS International Training Program. She was also a recipient of CFAR grant from AECOM to conduct a pilot study of HIV among women attending a health clinic in Mumbai. In October 2015, she has received Teaching Professorship Award from American Society of Microbiology to teach infectious disease at University of South Florida. I must say that you know we have had very nice stimulating interaction with Dr. Jenti Shastri over the period of time when we are working with her on different infectious disease problems and her clinical perspective has been uh, very motivating for the students uh, to, to really take these kind of challenges forward. I am sure she is going to enlighten and give her perspective on how infectious diseases are still so challenging and there is so much room, so much need to have intervention for engineering technologies in this area. So, let me welcome Dr. Jenti Shastri for her lecture. So very good afternoon to all of you. It's actually my very, very proud privilege to be uh, talking to such uh, bright students of the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, I cannot thank uh, Dr. Sanjeeva enough for giving me this opportunity. So what I really wanted to talk to you is about the challenges and opportunities we have in infectious disease diagnosis. And just to walk you through what we currently do in terms of infectious disease diagnosis and what is a possibility. So this is uh, the lab I head. Uh, we do molecular diagnosis for commonly uh, the acute febrile illnesses, which is dengue, malaria, typhoid, hepatitis. And uh, we also are the uh, regional HIV reference lab. So we do what is called as early infant diagnosis uh, for testing HIV in the newborn babies at six weeks and also do the HIV viral loads. So we are part of the national program. So anybody who's interested in seeing molecular diagnostics by real time PCRs for these infectious diseases, uh, you're welcome. So as we can see microbes, so when we say infectious agents of disease, there are number of infectious agents of disease 
Uh, infectious diseases, as we all know, is the scourge of mankind. There have been older diseases like plague, like whooping cough, like diphtheria. And we have been able to completely eliminate these diseases by vaccination. And what is now we are faced with are emerging infectious diseases. And that would be the last leg of my talk. So when we talk of bacteria, they could be both gram-positive and gram-negative. Why is it important? Because the antibiotics which we use for gram-positive organisms are different from those which we use for gram-negatives. That is because of their inherent cell wall nature. The gram-positive organisms have more of peptidoglycan and the gram-negatives have got more of lipids. And we can see that bacteria viruses, the dengue is a virus, hepatitis is a virus, then parasites, we have malarial parasite, trypanosomiasis, then we have all the worm infestations, these are all parasites, fungi could be candida, cryptococcus, histoplasmosis, other fungi which infect human beings. When it comes to a clinical sample which we receive in the laboratory for testing for infectious disease agents, we get all these kind of samples, the blood samples, stool samples, urine, nasopharyngeal aspirates, pus aspirates. We don't know whether this clinical sample has got bacteria, viruses, fungus or a, a parasite. So we have to put it through a battery of tests in order to individually identify these pathogens. The other alternative is do molecular diagnosis by multiplex PCR. And what is multiplex PCR? We have targets for bacteria, viruses, parasites all put together. We are up to an extent of 20 pathogens in the respiratory sample and we look for the presence of any of these agents. Why is it important for us to know? Because with bacteria, what we can do is the antimicrobial susceptibility testing, which is done by the conventional method in the laboratory using Euler Hinton agar, and we stroke, streak the plate with the microorganism, look for the zones of inhibition. But what we are seeing is drug resistance is on the rise. So we need to know whether the clinical sample has got drug resistant bugs or it has drug sensitive bugs. Whether artemisine, which is given as a drug of choice for malaria, is the parasite resistant or is it sensitive to that drug? So these are certain questions which always bog our minds when we are treating patients and when we are giving a diagnosis. And how, do <clears throat> how does antibiotic resistance come up? So there is a mixture of drug sensitive and drug resistant organisms and one organism to the other elements which are responsible for drug resistance are transferred from one bacteria to other. So what is our challenge? Is the infection due to bacteria, due to virus, due to fungus or a parasite? These are due to differences in the cell wall, it is able, you can use simple methods for identification because of cell wall differences. Whether the infecting agent is sensitive or resistant to simple antibiotics or you need higher antibiotics. Now I have just shown you our known methods that is through um, a DNA sequencing and this is a genomic analyzer. This is just a microchip with microfluidics. These are certain methods which can be employed to answer these questions. However, these are very time consuming and the clinician really has to wait a couple of days before he gets the answers. So what is the need of the R? I need a point of care test, a lab on chip. I need a chip which can tell me whether it is a bacteria, a virus, another thing. To the that would be my next part, which is how is it beneficial to the clinician to know whether it is a bacteria, whether it is a virus or a fungus or a parasite. Okay, so this is a food for thought for all you bright students. We need a very sensitive and a specific test 
which is available at the bedside. The sample also need not go to the laboratory. At the bedside, you can do this test. Whenever I get a viral pharyngitis, a sore throat, I never take antibiotics. Why? Because of selection pressure of the antibiotics, the next time I get infected, I may be resistant to the antibiotics which I have taken. So that is called as abuse of antibiotics. So we have to use antibiotics very rationally and not use it for viral and parasitic infections and limit its use only for bacterial infections. So we create a good antibiotic stewardship by antibiotic cycling. Now with these good point of care tests, the turnaround time for diagnosis of infectious diseases would also be reduced and it will give evidence. Today we are in the era of evidence-based medicine. We do not grope in the dark to see what the infection probably could be. There is nothing called as probability. There has to be an evidence. So, coming to the monsoon period, we all experienced this terrible Tuesday in 2005 when we Mumbai curves were all, you know, soaked and uh, this was the scene. And what do we see during these times? These are the diseases which we have to face. And there are diagnostic dilemmas as to what this infection probably could be. Patient presents with fever, headache, malaise, joint pains, rash. What is it? Is it dengue? Is it malaria? Is it leptospirosis? So, we are still grappling with this problem and what do we do? Then in dengue we have also seen that some patients present with severe dengue and some people present with less severe self-limiting dengue fever. Others have dengue shock syndrome, dengue hemorrhagic fever. And what are the detection methods? At my end in the laboratory as I told you we individually test for malaria, for leptospira, and for dengue. We have the antigen testing methods by serology. We have PCRs which we do. We look for the viral RNA, dengue specific RNA by real time uh, chemistries, the Pacman chemistries. And we have serology that is look for the antibodies which are both IgM and IgG. IgG is for secondary dengue. And malaria. Severe malaria is most commonly caused by infection due to Plasmodium falciparum, Vivax, Nolesi. The risk is increased if treatment of an uncomplicated attack of malaria caused by these parasites is delayed. And recognizing uncomplicated malaria is of vital importance and in children, Plasmodium falciparum malaria may develop so rapidly that early treatment of uncomplicated malaria is not feasible. So. What is the challenge is diagnosing these infections well in time and also knowing which of these patients are going to progress to severe malaria or severe dengue. We have a collaborative project with Dr. Sanjeeva. The PhD student Apurva is working on severe Vivax malaria and looking for a protein markers in severe malaria. So this is underway and it is showing a lot of promise in uh, understanding the pathogenesis of malaria. Now having said that, everything has to translate into better diagnostics. As a clinician, as an infectious disease diagnostic person, I need a test which will be foolproof which will be available at the bedside, which would not be very expensive. So this is wishful thinking, right? But I'm sure all of you have understood the magnitude of this problem and are really going to put your heads together in helping us come, um, get better diagnostics for that, for the betterment of patient care. So we have all the omics, the transcriptomics, proteomics, genomics, metabolomics, all this uh, addressing these issues of uh, better diagnostics but we need a point of care test so and the other thing is biomarker a potential biomarker which will tell me which of these infections is going to progress so this is going to help the clinician with diagnosis prognosis and treatment so the new way either I have 
तो मास स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी इज अगेन गोइंग टू टेक टाइम सो आई नीड समथिंग लाइक अ पॉइंट ऑफ केयर टेस्ट जीनोमिक्स इज गोइंग टू टेक टाइम इन फैक्ट वी इन मॉलिकुलर डायग्नोसिस गिव द रिपोर्ट बाय इन द एंड ऑफ द डे वेन वी गेट द सैंपल्स इन द मॉर्निंग बाय नाइन ए एम बट वी वॉन्ट समथिंग मच मोर क्विकर एंड मच मोर फास्टर तो नैनो टेक्नोलॉजी ऑल्सो होल्ड्स अ लॉट ऑफ प्रोमिस इन डायग्नोसिस ऑफ इन्फेक्शियस डिजीजेज इट कैन क्विकली आइडेंटिफाई द इन्फेक्शियस एजेंट सो दैट वी कम टू नो विच इज अवियर केस वी कैन क्वारंटाइन अ पेशेंट क्वारंटाइन ऑफ पेशेंट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट इन ऑर्डर टू प्रिवेंट पेशेंट टू पेशेंट स्प्रेड सो द कन्वेंशनल टेक्निक्स आर नॉट वेरी फास्ट वी नीड स्किल्ड वर्कर्स पुअर डिटेक्शन थ्रेश होल्ड लाइक वी हैव द एच आई वी uh viral load testing which requires at least 50 copies of the hiv virus to be present for the test to be positive so can we have a test which can detect lower copies of the virus so what are infectious diseases which are emerging these are evolutionary changes in the existing organisms spread of known diseases into new geographic areas ecological changes resulting in introduction of unusual agents and drug resistance the world health organization has warned in its 2007 report that infectious diseases are emerging at a rate that has not been seen before since 1970s there have been 40 infectious diseases which have been discovered and these are some of them just a little bit of information about sars so sars is a respiratory syndrome Sub uh, the subacute and respiratory syndrome which was it cropped up in the guangdong province of china and how near we are to china but it never came to india it knocked the doors very loudly on our territories but somehow we never got infected we don't know the reason we presume that we have been infected with so many respiratory viruses which have caused cross immunity so these are certain suppositions Ebola virus. Now we know that Sierra Leone and other places were in the grip of the Ebola virus uh, infection. However, fortunately for the Indians, it never seeped into India. Otherwise, I don't know how much, how many communities would have been wiped off because it is a highly transmissible virus, very easily transferred from one individual to another. so chikungunya we are in the grip of it even in delhi in mumbai swine flu we had two major epidemics in 2009 10 as well as in 2015 avian flu now has been declared in some parts of maharashtra so <clears throat> these are certain emerging infectious diseases so these are significantly correlated with socio economic environmental and ecological factors So this is the last part of my presentation is something which i thought was important to you people and uh, for us and that's where we could bridge the gap of artificial intelligence would it help to crack biology and as i understand there are lots of companies who are working on this project uh, the alphabet ibm microsoft all the big companies in the silicon valley So Chris Bishop of Microsoft Research in Cambridge observed one way of thinking about living organisms is to recognize that they are in a sense complex systems which process information using a combination of hardware and software. So in the squidgy words of biology and disease there are problems its software engineers can solve and the solution lies with all of you. So What are the challenges today? I don't know which is the infection which is going to tap my door and enter my territory. Do I have any information about the hot spots in my own country of certain infectious diseases? Well, in the West they are using GIS mapping for hot spots. So, can we use artificial intelligence for forecasting infectious diseases? and i also read that diagnosing illness by smell is also going to be a very near possibility and i'm sure it is the harvard medical school mit engineers and the baylor school of medicine and rice university all of them you know they have these collaborative projects for all these solutions and i think that's the way forward 
currently we have no preparedness we really keep banking on good luck and host immunity for not getting these infectious diseases well i have also read about drug discovery new molecules are discovered through artificial intelligence and uh, this is one actor in that theater of biology and artificial intelligence and two neuroscience drugs in the pipeline had the molecules have been discovered by artificial intelligence now these are uh, this was an article in jama where you can detect diabetic retinopathy and macular edema two causes of blindness through artificial intelligence there are lots of companies which are uh, you know coming up with artificial intelligence through apps to diagnose the uh, Uh, the patient's queries about symptoms and diagnose the conditions ibm is able to suggest treatment plans for a number of different cancers and all this has a potential to transform doctors abilities to screen for and diagnose disease where is it important it is extremely important where the doctor patient ratio is skewed if you go to london the nhs will give you an appointment after 2 months if you go with a lump in breast and go for an appointment after 2 months i think you will die of anxiety so in such conditions these apps are of very great use where they give you some direction about what probably the condition could be and where the waiting period see india is the best place for healthcare i can just pay walk into any a doctor's clinic and get myself examined it is not the same in the united states you are completely bound by your insurance policy as to where you go if your insurance policy expects you to go to one particular doctor switching doctors is really going to make holes in your pocket so these apps are going to be of great use in such places uh, to give some tentative diagnosis but of course it comes with a word of caution most known protein structures have been worked out from crystallized versions whereas in reality proteins are flexible more work needs to be done at the molecular level and coating sir isaac newton if i have seen further it is by standing on the shoulder of giants and if the brains of those giants happen to be made of silicon chips so be it so to end my talk i would say please stay focused work consistently on a problem maintain quality at all costs and come up with a low cost technology as is a developing country we cannot use very expensive diagnostics for patient care if solutions have to be offered at bedside they have to be affordable so thank you all for your attention and when you feel like giving up look back at how far you have come be strong stay on your path and never stop going Thank you very much.